remains at the Tar Pits. We are happy to welcome you all here to the La Brea Tar Pits, or La Brea Tar Pits and Museum. Um, to celebrate a saber tooth summer with fun activities, extended museum hours, uh, special pop-up talks, live DJ sets from Ladies of Sound and Big Junkie Sound Institute of Sound. Uh, tonight's talk is uh, titled, These Hips Don't Lie. Uh, uh, a collaboration between La Brea Tarpets and Cedar Sinai Medical Center. Home, home crowd, right? <laughs> um, uh, reveal social structure in Ice Age saber tooth cats. To talk about this collaboration and the coinciding display, which is right behind here, uh, is our guest, Dr. Robert Clapper. <laughs> and Dr. And Dr. Marie Felici. I'm going to talk a little bit about them, so it sounds like you all know them already. So, uh, okay, Dr. Robert Clapper is co-director of Joint Replacement Program at Cedar Sinai Medical Center, Department of Orthopedics in Los Angeles. Dr. Clapper is a graduate of Columbia College in New York, where he majored in art history. He received his medical degree from Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. Another round of applause for Dr. Clapper. And uh, Dr. Maivi Belisi is Augustine Family Curator at the Raymond M. Alf Museum of Paleontology in Claremont, California. And she's also a research associate at La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles, where she was the National Science Foundation postdoctoral research fellow from 2018 through 2020. She earned her PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of California, Los Angeles, while also a graduate student in residence at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. Another big round of applause. Thank you. Before we get started, we will have some timing for a couple of questions. Uh, at the end of this discussion, it will be a short discussion, about 30 minutes, uh, but we'll have some time. If you have any questions, just raise your hand, and I'll pass the mic over to you. But I want to get started because I think the best person to talk about it because he had a great story. Uh, Dr. Clapper, let's talk about the origin of this collaboration. This is the final scene of the movie. This is the beginning of the movie. You can see I had hair on top of my head. Thirty years ago, I came like all of you, just like all of you, I'm not a paleontologist, just visiting and saw that wall, which you all should take a look at before you leave, which has 404 direwolf skulls. And when I looked at it, I was mesmerized because it looks like they're all the same. But because, as Joel says, I'm an art history major, you look at the Sistine Chapel that Michelangelo made, there's over 400 figures on the ceiling, not one in the same position. So I became obsessed. You can't show that they're the same. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I do surgery on hips, knees, and shoulders that are abnormal. Where's the abnormal anatomy? And so I went from being a tourist to behind this glass and met Chris Shaw who was the curator of the museum at the time, and I introduced myself and said, where's the abnormal bones? And Chris Shaw, instead of throwing me out of the museum, thank God he didn't, said, come take a look, Dr. Clapper. And here's a replica, thanks to Jeff Busey, I have that he showed me. The real one is here, but this is a replica of a saber-toothed cat pelvis. He pulls out a drawer of three of these. Look, and you'll get to come up close and see this, and you'll look at the exhibit. This is the socket, the acetabulum of a hip. Your hip and the cat's hip. Normal, smooth, round. But then he showed me the other side. It looks like a bomb went off. He said, we've had this over 100 years. What do you think is going on? I said, it's one of three things. Infection, a fracture, cat was in a fight, 
but I think it looks like a birth defect. It looks like this animal was born with a bad hip, and he points to this spur, this big prominence here. What's this, Dr. Clapper? I said, that's an osteophyte. It's a bone spur. Chris Shaw says to me, the paleontologist, how long does it take for that to occur? I said, years. He said, are you telling me this cat was born with a bad hip, limped its entire life to adulthood, how is it gonna hunt? How does it drink water? Someone has to take care of it. I said, well, then that's what I'm telling you. He says, we believe these cats hunted alone like a mountain lion. But if you're telling me it lived to be an adult with a birth defect from birth, then that means we're wrong. That they're social animals, took care of themselves. We may have given them the nasty name saber tooth, like they're ferocious, but actually they took care of each other. And that's how this project began. He said, what do you want to do now, Dr. Clapper? I said, let me take the bones to Cedar sinai which we are well represented tonight. <laughs> and thanks to Dr. Barry Pressman, the head of radiology, I was able to use the CAT scan. And as soon as I saw, and you'll see in the exhibit, the slides coming up, I'm going, I was right. These animals were born with a bad hip. And it's such a beautiful thing to be here tonight, to collaborate these two giant institutions that never talked to each other before. And if you look at the corner on the right, you're gonna see the Cedar sinai logo here at the museum. That's how it started. And as far as the Will Chamberlain thing goes, in 1994, when I had air on top of my head, this man, seven foot one, comes into my office. Your hips, all of you. By the way, you're only the pre op or post-op, sooner or later me. This is the size of your hip. Will Chamberlain is seven foot one, 300 pounds. He has a bad hip, but I don't have a prosthesis that fits anything but normal sizes. So in 1994, I began using a CAT scan to create an exact replica of his hip so I could make a prosthesis for it. And this is Will Chamberlain's hip. Look at the difference. So the technology that I use to treat patients now is being used here at the tar pits to help diagnose problems. Thank you. Who is the lead of the study? Talk about the study and how you use that technology. Just overall, tell us about the study. So everybody knows here how CT scans work, yeah? Basically x-rays, so they let us take a look at the inside of a bone. So back in, when did we start collaborating? Like, I started here at the Target as a first Five company. years ago, something like that. And Avi is in the crowd. He's a young yeah. orthopedic surgeon who sat on an airplane. This is a great story. With a total stranger. And they're talking on the plane, and the stranger says to Avi, he should introduce himself, what do you do? Well, I'm a medical school at UCLA. What do you want to do? I want to be an orthopedic surgeon. Well, I used to host a radio show on ESPN with the Lakers called The Weekend Warrior. This total stranger says to him, you need to meet Dr. Clapper. So then he, he parachutes into my office as a medical student and says, I'd love to do a research project with you. So 30 years ago, I started. Five years ago, we collaborated, thanks to Avi, and really used the new CAT scan, the newer technology, and look at what happened. We, and Myreen will talk about the paper published, and then Emily Lindsay, who's here tonight, said, we now need to have an exhibit here in the museum. It's just amazing when we all break down the wall and talk to our neighbor, amazing things happen. So I actually didn't know that that's how you met Avi. That's how I met Avi. So you know, years of collaborating with Avi, and I never knew, so thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, so back in 2018, I had just started at the Targets. Uh, I was fresh out of grad school. Uh, I was here for four years. And um, yeah, and previously I had already worked on the same tooth cat, and they're both, they are like the bread and butter of my research. So generally I work on large mammalian carnivores. Um, and when I started here, basically, you know, Emily Lindsay, who was, or who is uh, one of the curators here, 
at the time, she was like, oh my gosh, finally we have a saber tooth cat specialist here. Um, and now, you know, there's we have a saber tooth cat project that involves collaboration with Cedar Sinai. And, you know, like this is totally in your uh, Dr. Alley. So uh, that is how I got involved in the project. And, you know, Dr. Clapper brought the expertise. And Dr. Clapper and Avi, there is Avi. Hello, Avi. There he is. Yeah, finally, thank you. Yeah, so Dr. Clapper and Avi brought the expertise, expertise and the Tarpix team, uh, led by myself and Emily Lindsay, so we brought the paleontological expertise. So, you know, we have this pathological um, uh, hip as Emily, associated femur, thigh bone as well, which you, both of which you can see here. And, okay, so this animal, as according to Dr. Clapper and Avi, was born this way, so how could that have impacted its behavior? Right, generally speaking. Well, the thing with a saber tooth cat is it is a large animal, and large animals generally, especially if you're a predator, you need to be on animals as large as or even larger than yourself. And so that's number one, uh, one of the, our first considerations for okay, if this animal had been born this way, it would have had trouble hunting that way because the hip bone would have played a critical role in how this animal would have hunted. And that's because the saber-toothed cat, as opposed to the dire wolf, so these two predators are the most common predators scared of the targets, right? So the dire wolf, you know, we've seen gray wolves today, we've also all seen Game of Thrones, right? So we all know that the dire wolf was more of a pursuit predator. It ran after its prey. In contrast, the saber-toothed cat was an ambush predator, so it would have needed to sit back on its hind legs, making the crib critical to its pouncing ability. So basically it was doing a squat and then launching itself at its prey. And so because of that, we thought, okay, it makes sense that the saber tooth would have had trouble hunting with its hip. However, the hypothesis that the saber-toothed cat was a social predator is not new. So, over a century of work has happened here at the La Brea Targets. Uh, we are, or this place where we all are today, um, has it, it's pretty incredible worldwide. It's pretty unique. It is the only uh, active, like actively excavated ice age locality in a huge city anywhere in the world, and this opens up really interesting possibilities. So the targets, um, you know, I, I'm sure you all have walked outside, right? So the targets have um, thousands of these saber tooth cats and dialogues. And um, in part because of that large number of animals here, um, that was one of the reasons that paleontologists have always had this idea that it was social. However, with the exception of lions, large cats today tend not to be social, right? Like Dr. Clapper brought up the example of the mountain lion, for example. So there's always been debate about whether or not Smilon, the um, scientific name for to get, whether or not it was social. Um, and so yeah, there's the large numbers of it here, there's the um, uh, there's the, uh, also the age structure, so there's a, a range of ages of saber tooths here, um, which also contributes to the hypothesis that it was social. So I think that what our study does is to contribute to this body of work that suggests that Spikenon was social. So our study um, contributes to, you know, indirect evidence that, okay, this saber tooth was born this way, and it had this, it was born this way, and then it grew to adulthood, right? Even with this pathology. And so, yeah, it must have had some functioning or food sharing abilities. Um, and conveniently, around the time that our paper came out, which was in 2021, another paper came out of the Royal Ontario Museum in Canada, uh, about some other saber tooth cats down in South America, also smiling on the same, um, the same type, sort of saber tooth cat that we had here. And what they found was what they interpreted as a family group of saber tooth 
mm. because it was they interpreted it as a mother and two cubs, not only because they were found close to each other, but also because they share this lower this is one tooth that tends to be uh, present in genetically related individuals. So when that paper came out, I was like, ah, this is this is the last piece that we need to you know, really support our suggestion that saber tooths probably, you know, were social, at least shared food, and that's how this animal thought to survive despite its disability. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I can kind of mention that a little bit and we'll talk about the overall kind of like theme of not just this project but the study itself but the importance of collaboration. So we want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, Dr. Papi, you want to start in terms of like the importance of collaboration. You know, not just with seniors and departments, but it's just in general. I mean, just kind of how you kind of see the world. The way I see the world is I'm an artist. As a surgeon, as an observer, I am not a paleontologist, but something's going on here that I'm used to seeing is abnormalities. But to be able to take the technology from a completely different world, modern medicine, and the tools that I use, and bring those tools here, there's a great expression my professor, Dr. Ranawa, taught me. The eyes don't see what the mind doesn't know. So all day long, there they are behind the glass doing their thing and seeing these animals a certain way. It's great for me, to, a doctor, to come from a completely other place and go, wait a minute, why don't you use a CAT scan that we use or other technology? And what's so exciting for me is, look at what I did with three bones, because I'm a hip surgeon, with just three bones. They have five million bones. If you look through this window, rows of specimens. I can't wait to bring the spine surgeons I work with to look at the spines, which haven't built the foot and ankle surgeon. And what about, as Dr. Belisi talks about, the fractures? Think about it. If you're pouncing out of the bushes, your rib cage is slamming into a big animal. As she said, the same size or bigger. The one of these sloths. Look at this like, giant bear over there. They're, they're going after these kinds of things. Guess what? They're going to fracture their ribs. But here's what's interesting to me as an orthopedic surgeon. If you break your ankle, I can look, I'm trained, to see the pattern of the fracture. And I, in setting the bone, reverse the mechanism that caused the fracture. That's how we treat spiral and all kinds of fractures. Can you imagine Dr. Charles Moon, he's the head of the trauma service at Cedars. He texts me and goes, they had fractures in the museum? Like, I can't wait to bring his eyes and his brain to look at the fractures in the saber tooth cat and the dire wolf. And he'll go, nope, this is what happened. This guy didn't pounce out of a bush. This is what we see when they fall out of a tree. It's just going to be so exciting to, to bring these two institutions who never talked together before together. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I really want to see that. So for the record, we do get a lot of fractures here. Um, so the Lorraine Target is one of the few fossil localities that I know of that has a separate pathology collection. Um, so Chris Shaw, who was collections manager at the time that um, Dr. Clapper first visited, um, Chris Shaw and a collaborator who was an orthopedic surgeon, uh, Fred Heald, uh, so both of them together, as they were going through the tar pits bones, they started pulling out, this was back in the, you know, 80s and 90s, right? So... Shaw and Heald were pulling out bones, separating them if they had traces of pathology or healed injuries or anything else that looked out of the ordinary, um, separating them into a pathology collection on their own. So pathology is pretty rare. Uh, so just for reference, back in 2017, um, a collaborator and I um, looked at the pathologies here and we calculated a prevalence of only 3%. 
right? So 3% is small, but if you multiply it by 35,000 bones, which is the sample size that we looked at, that ends up being a huge number. And so the tar pits has these large sample sizes and, um, and that, uh, that preserves some sort of pathology. So one of the things that we quantified back in 2017 was um, we did see quite a number of rib fractures and also, um, also some pathologies in the spine. Uh, so we interpreted those like in the spine um, toward where the, the ribs articulate right. with the spine. So we interpreted that as, okay, maybe the saber tooth was getting body, or it, it was body slamming this bison or this giant ground sloth. And so that trauma was traveling right. up the spine. Right. However, if they were falling out of trees, that would be cool too. That's, you know, yeah. more insight into their right. behavior. I have one other thing to say, Joel, if you don't mind. I'm not a pale paleontologist. I want her autograph because it's really cool to be next to someone like this. But because I'm not a paleontologist, neither are you. But let me tell you a story that Chris Shaw told me. When they found this of the three abnormal pelvises, smooth, normal acetabulum, like a bomb went off, over there, they then dug up over there, the other side of the property, this femur. It was Chris Shaw's receptionist, not a paleontologist, who said, as she's looking on her desk one day, maybe they belong to each other. And he gives full credit to the observation of his receptionist, who's not trained. I'm not trained. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. But to all the little kids out here, how inspiring it is that you can make these observations as well. You don't have to be intimidated. My curiosity led to this project, and I just encourage all of you to be curious as well. Thank you. Yes. Joel, Dr. Belisi. Sorry, I have one more point Go for it. to add to that. So, you know, new perspectives, right? New perspectives even on old problems. Like this specimen, the, this pair of specimens was discovered um, a century ago, and then there's new technology, and now we get new insights. So um, Ashling Farrell, who's in the audience, um, and I, and a collaborator who's a veterinary surgeon in Sweden, uh, we just published a different paper on pathology, uh, this time with the saber tooth and also the dire wolf that found um, abnormalities in the knee joints and the elbow joints, basically. Um, and, you know, we got questions about that. Like, how did it, like from the media, for example, we got questions like, why wasn't this noticed before? And I said, because paleontologists were looking at it before and we interpreted it as something else. But it really takes new, like, perspectives, diverse perspectives, mm -hmm. right? coming together to create synthetic knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really the theme of, of this project yes. as a whole, right? And really why we're here. Um, so let's kind of talk about, I know we're running out of time already, but the interdisciplinary factor. Like you mentioned, your art history, you brought up the Sistine Chapel in terms of how you perceive that dire wolf. So tell us a little bit about the, the importance of that. Uh, Dr. Clapper, art history, you have literature, Dr. Belisi, in your background. Why, why do you think that's important? When Vermeer painted The Milkmaid, and I encourage you all to look it up, Vermeer's Milkmaid, this is a two-dimensional picture, and it ain't moving. It's a painting. But when you take art history, your professor will teach you, this is special, because she's pouring the milk out of the pitcher. Pouring milk out of the pitcher is movement. It's dynamic. He's painting movement. The challenge of two-dimensional. Today I did four surgeries. I'm looking at x-rays. They're two-dimensional. And they're static. Your body is not two-dimensional. It's three-dimensional and it moves. So the ability to look at two-dimensional paintings and create three-dimensional or movement in static paintings 
to me, it, it's powerful as a surgeon to be able to use two-dimensional items. And x-rays are black and white. Yeah, you're not black and white. You're in living color when I open you up. So to be able to be creative and imagine from my studies what your body is like when I operate on you, to me, it's powerful. Dr. Belisi, do you have something to add? Yeah, so I was, so I went to, I did my undergrad at UC Berkeley. Are there any other Calabares out there? Woo, yeah, thank you. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I did my undergrad there, and I double majored in integrative biology, which gave me the paleo aspect, and also comparative literature. And then my comparative literature, uh, I studied Japanese and Russian, and so it was a lot, um, but you know, just these different perspectives. And what I got out of that was, well, number one, through comparative, through comparative literature, I learned how to communicate ideas generally, which is really useful when you're a scientist, right? So that's one thing, you know, I think that a lot of people are like, oh, I don't like science, I'm gonna go into the humanities, but there's actually a lot that the humanities can bring right. to the sciences. Right. And number two, also um, doing those two very different literatures, um, you know, Japanese and Russian, I realized, well, actually they, underwent some similar drivers in their history and you know just seeing convergence and parallel trajectories in these I, I was able to take that perspective to paleontology then um, because I study not just saber-toothed cats and direwolves all over the last 50,000 years but I also study bone cracking dogs over the last you know 20 million years and I also study false saber-toothed cats, which are something else, like over the last 30 million years. And all of those are different lineages, like different branches of, you know, our family tree that have just undergone similar pressures. And then, you know, some of them went extinct and some persist to the modern day. So all of these stories, but in yeah. evolution. Yeah. Agree. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Running out of time, but I want to give you a little bit of time, uh, and for uh, both of you, talk a little bit about your work and your practice. Dr. Belisi, talk about ALF Museum a little bit, and okay. what you're doing now. All right, yeah, so the ALF Museum, uh, so I did my postdoc here at the Tarpits, but I'm actually now a curator, or the curator at the ALF Museum of Paleontology, which is in Claremont, and we have a pretty good contingent here tonight, so thank you all for coming. Um, one of my students is here, Connor Keeney, right there. Connor is working on insects preserved in asphalt over at least the last 20,000 years. Um, we have um, an intern, Aiden, who is here as well. So Aiden is also working on research with me, but on a, an older um, time frame, uh, so five million years ago from the Central Valley of California. And so generally at the Alp Museum as curator, uh, I work with museum collections. We're a smaller museum than this. Uh, so we have about 20,000 specimens, or sorry, 200, almost 200,000 specimens. Um, and the really special thing about our museum is that we are the only accredited museum of paleontology that is on the campus of a secondary school, which is how I get to work with Connor, who is a high school student. Um, so Connor is doing you know, really great research at a relatively early level. And so at the ALF Museum, um, yeah, I love, you know, I really, I still collaborate with the La Brea Tar Pits because this is just such an exceptional locality. But at the ALF Museum, we do have dinosaurs, uh, which they don't have here at the Tar Pits. So, you know, y'all should come visit us sometime. Thank you. Sorry, Tar Pits. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Dr. Clapper, you have any to plug? You have any new I'll surgeries? Leave, I'll leave you all with <laughs> A story. Yes. When We're not go, leaving yet, though. We're not you, leaving when yet. When you go home tonight, Google Michelangelo's David. He made this sculpture in 1503. Look carefully at his left hand. Above his heart, you will see skin and tendon, no veins, because your hand is above your heart and it collapses. Look carefully at Michelangelo's David holding the under end of the slingshot with his right hand 
below his heart. You'll see the veins blowing up. He made this sculpture in 1503. It was not until 1627, more than 120 years later, that Dr. William Harvey, the cardiologist in London, was knighted by the Queen of England for the greatest discovery of understanding arteries, veins, and circulation. He's knighted. But Michelangelo made the David in 1503, 120 years before the doctors, he's showing us collapsed veins. The reason I'm telling you that story is, you asked me about the love of art, the love of science. It's when you cross collaborate, the world of art can teach the world of science and vice versa. And that's what's so special to me about this project. Here I am, an orthopedic surgeon, not a paleontologist, getting to collaborate with Chris Shaw and Emily Lindsay and Dr. Belisi to now have an exhibit. Like I said, I hope some of you are in the movie business because this is a movie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're almost out of time, but I think we can take one more question. Does, or one question. Does anyone have any pressing... What the, how long did a saber-toothed tiger live? Ooh, that's a really great question. So we, our best, okay. They were on Medicare. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> um, so this particular specimen that we studied, we estimated it to be about four to seven years old based on living lions. More work needs to be done on that. So it was adult. It's just that, you know, I don't know how that translates to human years, but it did grow to adult size. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, I wanted to give you both an opportunity to just kind of wrap up and tell us what's the biggest takeaway from uh, this project that you've both worked on for you individually or even in your work, in your practice. For me, think about it. This poor animal is being called a vicious saber-toothed cat. And in reality, we're wrong. He's not, or she is not vicious. This study actually shows they took care of each other. That's number one. But also, we're humans. We look down on the animal world, right? We're smart, they're not. But let me ask you this question. Riddle me this, Batman. If you're limping because your hip hurts and you can't chase that other animal because you can't run that fast or jump out of the bushes, you're not a stupid animal, right? Because you look around and go, why the hell do I have to chase this antelope? Why don't I just hang out at this place that's sticky that these other animals can't run very fast anymore? And you can imagine the intelligence of an animal to say, I'm gonna be here with my bad hip and not out there. So not only did I learn that they took care of each other, and we need to learn about that as climate change and what we're facing now, we can learn from ice age animals and we better learn, but also the reality is they're intelligent because they probably hung out here because this was a great place to catch prey so they don't have to run so fast with a bad hip. I don't know, Dr. Clapper, they still got stuck in a tar pit. <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. My, <laughs> thank, you, thank you for taking that well. Um, so my takeaway is, um, so these animals are pretty geologically recent, right? Like, um, okay, everybody hold out your arms for me, please. Okay, so if we're talking about our arm, dinosaurs are right around your armpit. Where are we, right? Where's the ice age? The ice age, saber tooths are about your knuckle, right? So we are the very tip of our fingertips, of our fingernails. Like if I just buff my fingernail, that's all of human history, right? So saber tooths are pretty close to us. Even though we think of them as so different from us, you know, they used to live here in Los Angeles. Like probably the earliest humans here in Los Angeles met these saber tooths. 
And so that's something that's pretty special, mm -hmm. I think, you know, that connection um, that I hope will enhance your appreciation of the place where we all live. Thank you. A big round of applause again, Dr. Clapper, Dr. Belisi. Thank you so much for being here.